All right, you guys ready for a quick recap of this series? Okay, here's a quick recap. The first week of this series, we talked about our response to the chaos that is happening in the world around us. You remember that? That was during revival that Saturday. And we came to the conclusion that our response should be faith in action, not fear and anxiety. Okay, and we also talked about that Sunday, uh, Israel, and we talked about their history, where they started, the ups and downs, the in-betweens, and where they are today in 2023. They got scattered a long, long time ago, but God very recently regathered them in 1948. That is central to the prophetic timeline of the end times. And that tells us that God's everlasting covenant that he made to Abraham is still in effect today. Then we talked... Um, a couple weeks ago, about the actual and literal signs of the times, like, like things that are happening today uh, that we can see in the world around us. We're all living in it, and we looked at what Scripture explicitly states uh, the end times will look like, and we also talked about how all of those things have happened within the past hundred years, which is no time at all. And we came to the conclusion that we are indeed living in the last days. And we don't know how long they last or how far they reach, but make no mistake about it, these are the last days. Amen. This week, we're moving on to the next part of the story. Now that we know how to respond, now that we know all about Israel, um, and we can actually see the signs of the times, and we acknowledge that we're in the last days, now we're going to dive in to what some people believe to be the most complicated, prophetic, confusing, and scary book in the Bible. Doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? Some of y'all like, this series already been scary. What are we getting into? Buckle up. Revelation gets crazy. The title of the message this morning is The Revelation of Christ. Say Revelation of Christ. Revelation of Christ. And I just have to say that the next few weeks are going to be a Bible study. Everybody say Bible study. So if you're coming to church to hear a, a foo-foo message and feel good, live your best life, you came to the wrong place. You came to the wrong place. We're getting into the Bible. We have to get into the Bible. We are biblically illiterate. So bring your Bible. Who's got their Bible? Raise it up high on the sky. Some of you do. Some of you saw it. The phone's going up. I love that. I love that. Also, bring a highlighter and a pen. Um, because you're going to need to take notes. Before we get into it, I want to give you an update on the state of the world, okay? Uh, just in case you thought everything has gotten better and the world is back to normal, it hasn't and it isn't. Let me, let me tell you about it. In the past couple of weeks, there's been a Category 5 hurricane that decimated parts of Acapulco, Mexico. A volcano in Italy is rumbling and scaring everybody to death. People are actually starting to say, what is going on? What's happening is, is biblical proportions, like, this is really freaking us out that we've got earthquakes under the San Francisco airport. We've got a volcano in Italy about to go off. We've got hurricanes. The world is losing its mind. People are seeing it. Also, possibly the worst of everything, anti-Semitism is exploding across the globe. Not just, not just kind of. The hatred for the Jewish people has taken the world by storm. Get this. People are rushing airports to wait for Jewish people to get off of planes. That's terrifying. Demonstrations and protests are breaking out across America. And the world is supporting Hamas with a hatred for Israel. Okay, on our college campuses, people in Congress, vote them out. Get them out. This is not the time to be somewhere in the middle. No. The entire world is turning against Israel. And this book said it would happen. This book said it would happen, and it is right now. Did you know this is, this is frightening, cool to read, because it's fun to watch prophecy come to life. However, this is terrifying. I want, I want you to pay attention to this next part. Did you know that the Bible says that in the end times, like in the final days of the last days, like right before the Antichrist and the beast and the dragon, all this stuff, right before that happens, the entire world is going to turn against Israel. Did you know that? Yeah. The entire world. Now, up until now, that hasn't seemed like a probability or a possibility, but I want you to think about something. I want you to hear me on this next part because this is serious and it's happening right now. The president of Turkey, Erdogan, has recently come out against Israel and threatened to declare war. Why is that important? Why do we care? Well, 
Turkey is a NATO country. That means if Israel defends itself against Turkey, technically, because we too are a NATO country, technically the U.S. and every other NATO country, which includes all of Israel's allies, would have to stand with Turkey and against Israel. Are you seeing this? You see how that's a possibility? The entire world will turn against Israel, and I believe we're watching the beginning of that right now. How long it will take, we don't know, but you're watching it play out right now. That is the reality of the world that we're living in in 2023. So my encouragement to you is keep praying. Don't stop. Don't, don't stop praying for the people of Israel, for peace in Jerusalem. Keep praying. Keep praying that we'll get elected officials that have some brains and some competence. Keep praying. Don't stop. By all means, Paul says, when you've done everything to stand, keep on standing. Don't stop. Stay in the word. Stay focused on God because this book is coming alive right before our eyes. And that's why we're getting into the book of Revelation because it talks about what's happening in the world right now. And we need to know about it. Today, we're starting our journey into the book of Revelation. And my goal is to demystify and untangle this idea that the book of Revelation cannot be understood or read adequately uh, because I believe that it can, okay? I also believe that it's easier to just read what the Bible says than to read in to what other people think it meant to say, okay? I approach this word of God, I approach it very literally, all right? I believe that God wrote us a Bible we can understand, so that's how I view scripture. I, I view it as actual and literal and happening before our eyes. Now, I want to make this clear. There's a lot of speculation and interpretation when it comes to the book of Revelation. All right, many people think the entire book is metaphorical. Others believe that every single line of it is literal. I'm somewhere in the middle closer to literal. And one of the hardest parts of my job, one of the most complicated elements of being on this stage is trying to talk about a singular subject that has a plurality of viewpoints because I cannot say everything every time I say anything. So I am going to travel and teach through the book of Revelation the way that I understand it and the way that I read it. And if there's something that you disagree with, that's okay. We can talk about it. We can discuss it. You don't have to leave the church. We can still be friends. Let me ask you a question. Do you agree with your husband on everything? No? No? Do you agree with your wife on everything? The answer is no, you don't. But do you pack up your things and leave the house? No, that's silly. Same way with church, don't leave. So I'm gonna skip everything, I'm gonna skip the formalities, I'm gonna skip a lot of things, and we're gonna jump right into the book uh, because this book is slam packed with imagery and characters and symbols and heavenly scenes. And this is undoubtedly my favorite book in the Bible, and it's the book that started my transition into getting saved. God, God led me to this book, and I said, I've never heard about the book of Revelation before, and it just blew my mind. It's my favorite book in the Bible. Next week, we're going to, in the weeks to come, we're going we're gonna to continue on. So if you're following along in your Bible, go ahead and pull it out, put it on your lap, uh, get it ready to go. <clears throat> if you're following along in the Bible app, you can open that right now, go to events, <clears throat> click on Summit, Summit Elkins, Summit Church, and you can follow along with the scriptures that way. I want you to flip to the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. If you've gone to the maps, you've gone too far. If you're in Judges, you're lost. <laughs> I want to start off by giving you guys some context. Are you good with that? We're gonna, it, I'm going to talk about a few things before we get into the book. And we're not going to make a whole lot of progress on this book today, but, but I want to give you some context that sets up the weeks to come. Um, the Bible starts with Genesis. Everybody, everybody with me on that? And Genesis tells us how everything began, okay? It's the book of beginnings. It literally means the, the, the beginning. And most people think that the book of Revelation is the opposite of Genesis. Um, it's at the end of the Bible, so it must be a book of endings, right? And it certainly does tell us how things are going to end. But the book of Revelation is also a book of beginnings. In fact, I would argue that that is the main theme, Yes, the book talks about hell and Satan and the beast and the false prophet and the dragon, but it's all pointing towards something. 
And that something is the return of Christ and the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth and a new Jerusalem and this new eternal celestial adventure with Christ, okay? And let me tell you something about that. It is unimaginably, unthinkably, unfathomably majestic and unbelievable. It's the greatest thing you'll ever experience in your life. That's what this book is pointing towards, the beginning of that world. So don't get lost in all of the imagery and stuff thinking this is all about the end because it points to the beginning. Now, there's four main points of view on the book of Revelation. You guys ready to get deep here? Y'all wake up. You ready to get deep here? Come on. I need you to hang with me tonight, today. The first view is the preterist view. Everybody say preterist. The preterist view. And they believe, reading this book, that everything already happened and that it culminated in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem, okay? There's a couple problems with that perspective, a couple big problems, first of which Jesus has not come back yet, okay? The second problem is tribulation has not happened. Some people say that hell is happening right now. Uh, No, you're very wrong and you're in for a very rude awakening. Okay, the preterist view. The second is the historical view. Say historical. Historical. And they believe that the book of Revelation is just a general picture of church history, that it's all metaphorical, and that the book is just trying to give us an overview of the entirety of the church. There's a couple problems with that as well. Remember, I'm giving you my perspective and my opinion. How would anybody, anybody reading this book come to that understanding without somebody else giving them their opinion. They wouldn't, okay? The third is the idealistic view. Say idealistic. Idealistic. And they believe this is just a timeless allegory. True of all times and any age. It just paints a general picture of a struggle between good and evil. It's just a really, really good story. But there's also a couple problems with that. If it's just a really good story, what do you do with the promise of the new heavens and the new earth at the end of the book? That would be totally irrelevant. If it's just a picture between good and evil, totally unnecessary. That is is the idealistic view. The fourth and the final view that we're talking about is the futurist view. And it believes that this book is prophetic, that this book is actually going to happen Okay, that this book applies to us today and is telling us of literal future events. And while there are metaphors, the majority of the book is literal and actual, and we take it as such. This is where I stand and the perspective that I speak from, because I don't think God tried to confuse us with this book. I think he's writing us a letter to tell us the end of the times, and we can read it as such. Here's another fact. This book is not the revelation of Satan, okay? I thought it was for a long time. Now, he's in there. He's got a supporting role, but this book is not dedicated to Satan. This book is the revelation of Christ. This whole book is about Jesus. It starts with him. It ends with him. The first line of the book says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, Highlight that in your Bibles, and don't forget it. Now, there are over 400 verses in the book of Revelation. 360 of them are Old Testament references. This tells us a couple things. The first is, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, the symbols are going to seem a little bit strange to you. It also tells us that the fact that the last book of the New Testament is primarily Old Testament further supports the reality that God is not done with the Jewish people, that his covenant will continue until the end of the age. Why would God put the last book in the Bible that tells us how it's going to end? Why would he make it Old Testament? Because he's got a covenant to keep. Oh, man, this is good, y'all. Okay, something else, something else. This is an eschatological book. Everybody say eschatology. Eschatology. You're not speaking in tongues. Say eschatology. eschatology. That means the study of the end times. And it scares a lot of people, but it sets me on fire. I love this stuff because it's better than any fantasy book you've ever read. Guess why? Because it's not a fantasy. This is a nonfiction actually going to happen. And this book was written somewhere around 90 AD by the apostle John. Now, at this point, 
uh, the Apostle John was some sort of a legend. He was some degree of a legend. What do I mean by that? You see, all the other apostles died a martyr's death. And John almost, Ron's message last week, John almost died the same way. You see, they tried to kill John in a horrifying way. Get this. They heated up a, a, a big cylinder vat of oil. And once it was boiling, they threw John in it. He didn't die. They couldn't kill him. And because they couldn't kill him, could you just imagine that for a second? That's horrific, y'all. I imagine he's pretty scarred after that. I'm not going to lie. He's probably like, Lord, that was a little too much. Um, <laughs> and because they couldn't kill him, they exiled him to an island called Patmos. It is on this island of Patmos, somewhere around 90 AD, that the Apostle John, an old man at this point, has this incredible manifest encounter with Jesus, and the book of Revelation is born. And the whole book of Revelation is this experience that only John had, where Jesus shows up and takes him into the heavenly realms and shows him how the world is going to conclude and how eternity is going to begin. That is the book of Revelation. One more thing. One more thing. This is what's called apocalyptic literature. Say apocalyptic. apocalyptic. Yeah. Now, when we hear that, we think of like Apocalypse Now. Who was the guy that played? It was in that. Uh, Francis, Ford. Francis Ford? I never heard of Francis Ford. Um, <laughs> who's the guy? At, uh, two men and a woman. What's that movie show? Two and a half men? Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen. That's who it was. <laughs> Godly man. Um, We think of that stuff, all right? We think of War of the Worlds, uh, Apocalypse. But really, the word apocalypse means to unveil, to reveal the revelation of Christ. You guys with me? Yes. Let's get into chapter one. And I'm not going to go verse by verse, but we are going to summarize the chapters by looking at key scriptures, okay? So I'm going to summarize some parts, and I'm going to read other parts. So the first thing I want to look at is chapter one, verse one. And I just want to read the first five words to you. I already did. I'm going to do it again. Highlight it or underline it. Verse one says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Does it say the revelation of the devil? Does it say the revelation of hell and destruction and fear and worry and anxiety? No, no. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, now skip down to verse eight. Could somebody turn the air conditioner on this place? I'm about to sweat to death up. I'm about to sweat to death up in this house. Oh my goodness. Let me take a drink of water before I pass out from heat stroke. Mm. We prayed for the fire to fall, but my goodness, now we're praying for the air conditioning to kick on in Jesus' name. Okay, verse 8, verse 8. Y'all at verse 8? God is going to speak up in a display of divine authority, okay? God the Father is going to speak. And by doing this, he's letting us know that he approves and confirms of everything that follows. And the Father says this in Revelation 1, 8. He says this. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And we know that it's God the Father because this is not red letter. It is black. So this is God the Father speaking, and he says, I am he. Okay, I am the beginning and the end. Then right after that, all right? Now, remember, John is like in this, this heavenly place, and his mind's already blown. He's already like, what is going? This is crazy. Okay, then God speaks up. Right after that, John hears a voice behind him. All right, and it probably scared him all the way to death in verse 11. So John does what any of us would do. He turns around to see who it is. And the first thing he sees are seven lampstands. Isn't that strange? What even is a lampstand? Why would he see lampstands? More on those in just a minute. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, he sees a man standing there, not creepy whatsoever. And this is the description of that man that John sees that he gives us. Okay, now pay attention because this is the whole point of the first, this message, all right? This is the revelation of... Okay, this is, check this out. You ready? This is John's description. I'm going to read it to you. And you can highlight it, write it down, circle it. Revelation 1, 13 through 16 says this. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man 
dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was as white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was bright like the sun shining in all its brilliance. That's the man that John sees. And right after this, John falls as if he is dead. He gets slain in the Holy Ghost. Yeah, we would have as well. Then this man, he says, fear not. Don't you love that in scripture? Someone will be minding their own business, going about their day. And angels will show up. Why are you crying? <laughs> Fear not. My goodness, you could have went about this a little bit different. <laughs> this man says, Fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, but behold, I am alive forevermore. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Who is this man? John is face to face with the glorified Christ. Jesus is standing before John as this heavenly, majestic, glorified being, and it takes John off of his feet, and it would you too. You see, it's one thing for me to read this to you and for you to imagine it. It's another thing to visualize it. Is anybody a visual learner in here? And I looked everywhere for a picture of this, and there, one does not exist. It just doesn't exist. I don't know why, but it doesn't. I wanted to see this image, because when I read it, I have this idea of what I'm seeing, but I want to see it. I want to see this image that John is depicting. So I couldn't find one, and so I collaborated with Photoshop and artificial intelligence, and I made one myself, y'all. And so what you're about to see is no person on earth has ever seen this before. This is all natural, all original Summit Church all right, you guys ready for this? Because this is intense. This is what John saw. I want you to look at this. This is what he saw. Look at that. Based on Revelation, that is what John is describing. Does that look like a man you want to mess with? Does that look like a man you want to trifle with? Eyes blazing with fire. Hair as white as snow, feet glowing red hot to crush the head of the serpent once and for all. A sword in his mouth, which represents the word of God, adorned with gold. His presence is bright as the sun. And the first time I read this in my most recent study, it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up because that is what I saw when I was reading it. This is a picture of a resurrected Christ reigning with power and glory and majesty. Listen, this is not the lamb that was slain. This is not the suffering servant. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That right there is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And hear me, this is the Christ that is coming back to wage war on hell and cast Satan into a lake of fire. That guy, that guy. Guys, this is King Jesus. This is Yeshua HaMashiach, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, God of the battle, and he's not messing around. So as we read through this book, I want you to picture this Jesus, not the lamb, but the lion, because the next time we see Jesus, you're going to see him like this, mounted on a white horse, riding through the clouds. And with one word, death and hell will be decimated forever. Oh, this is good, man. So first God speaks up. And then Jesus shows up. And this sets the tone for the rest of the book. It gets dark. It gets scary and uh, just crazy, absolutely crazy. Beyond bad, really. I mean, y'all, you ever heard a locust flying up out of hell? 
that have faces and tails like scorpions and they're demonically possessed and they sting you but you can't die? You ever heard of that? You ever heard of anybody wanting to die and they're like, just kill me. This is so bad, just kill me. And they can't die. Supernaturally, they're preserved for suffering. Can you? It gets bad, y'all. It gets bad. But this, remember, this is our leader and provider and protector. We are on that team. That is our commander. That is the one who fights for us. I had another two pages written. And I was going to move on to chapter two and three today, which talk about the seven letters to the seven churches. And there's some symbolism in there, which was really cool. Um, and we're going to get to that. I think I, think I want to go a different direction. Um, and I want to go back to something. I want to go back to something that is easy to miss. And it's central to this picture of the glorified Christ. Okay? And I want to talk about John's response when he saw the revealed Christ. What did John do? We just read this, guys. This is going to be a long series. He fell to the ground as if he was dead. It brought him to his face. You see, the first time that Jesus came, he came as a suffering servant. He came as a lamb led to the slaughter. But hear me, folks. The next time that he comes, he is coming as this man, okay, the lion, of the tribe of Judah. And when Jesus saw this man, he fell as if he was dead. Think about this for a second. John saw Jesus when he was human. He saw him. He walked with him. He was at the cross, at the ascension. He he knew what Jesus looked like. Did John fall on his face at the ascension? Doesn't say he did. But here, something comes over John that's so compelling and overwhelming and, 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 and terrifying, really, that he falls on his face as if he is dead. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about for just the next few minutes. Would you say that this man is worthy to be feared? I want to talk about the fear of God for the last few minutes. Would you say that this man deserves to be feared? I certainly, I certainly say that. I want to suggest something for you this morning. That man behind me is in this room right now. He's here. Do you know what we do? Even in the midst of all the chaos breaking out across the world, I'm watching it happen all over the place. I keep up with quite a few churches, and I watch the messages they're preaching on and the stuff they're talking about. And I'm not putting anybody down or anything like that, but it just seems like Like, we have recency bias so bad. Something can happen, and a week later, we forget about it. Ah, Israel will be fine. And we go back to life as normal. Meanwhile, this man is in this room saying, Church, wake up. Wake up. Stay awake. Don't go back to sleep. He is here right now. But so often, we come to church with this lackadaisical, complacent, what's in it for me mentality. Even in the last days, y'all, Jesus could come back next week. Based on the way I read scripture, I don't think he is. But it's soon. And this man right now in 2023, November, is walking around this room and he is seeking and searching for those who are willing to fall as though they are dead in worship and reverence and honor for the king. He's not looking for people who say it, who talk it. He's looking for people that are living it. And I see a lot of people right now that, even in the last days, aren't really living it. It's still not real yet. 
John's response is a perfect picture of what it means to fear the Lord. And that is something that the church as a whole has forsaken, especially in 2023. We just don't fear God. And with everything that is happening on the news and in the headlines, what we fear is the world. But we are not called to fear the world. We are called to fear the Lord. Job 28, 28 says, and he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Why should we turn away from evil? Why should we fall on our face and repent and recommit to God and convince others to do the same like their soul depends on it? Why? Because that man is coming back to take a vengeance on anyone who refuses to. This is serious. And I feel like God is saying, my church says that they love me, but they don't fear me. We come to church and we say all the things and we go through the motions, but we don't have any concept of what it really means to fear the Lord. Do you know why that is? Well, the first, the first, the first reason is we're comfortable, really comfortable. But the second reason is so long in the church, there's been a watered down gospel. This woe is me mentality. God, what's the next? Give me my breakthrough. Give me, give, what, what, what am I doing, God? What's in it for me? And we have taught and we have preached that God is loving and he's merciful. Oh, he just loves you so much. And he does. <laughs> and he is a tender and gracious and forgiving father, yes. But we've forgotten something. Does that man look like a passive oatmeal Jesus to you? Do, do you look at this and say, what a precious Savior? No. He's an all-consuming fire. This is the king that is coming back. And he is worthy to be feared and honored and revered and glorified and magnified and lifted high as we bring ourselves low. God is all of those things. But we forget that God is also this guy. And we've lost what it means to fear the Lord. And we let pride stand in the way. We let arrogance stand in the way. We let selfishness, shame, guilt, condemnation, all that junk, we let it stand in the way of bowing before the king. And hear me on this. If you are not covered by the blood of Jesus, if there's anybody in this room or watching online and you do not know that man as your Lord and Savior, if you're not standing behind him, he's looking at you. And that is not what you want. And if you are not covered in the blood of the lamb, I'm here to tell you something that's very scary. You should shake, you should tremble, you should, you, should, you should be as afraid as you've ever been. This man is coming back. And if you are not covered by the blood, he will stand before you. He will condemn you. He will call you guilty. And he will sentence you to eternal death in the lake of fire. Does that sound like loving, peaceful? Oh, yeah, just God forgives everything, and I can really live however I want to live, and God will forgive me. And Do you want to play with this man? No. Absolutely not. We've lost the fear of the Lord. Come on. And I believe that this man is saying, church, time is short. Wake up. Quit playing pity patty or whatever you call it. Quit playing patty cakes. Forget about the watered-down gospel. It's fake. Forget about comfortable Christianity. It's not in the Bible. Forget about it. Forget about the gray area. It doesn't exist, and if it does, it belongs to Satan. You're either in or you're out. He says, I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you are neither, I will spit you out. Which means Christ can do more with somebody that's cold than he can with somebody who's lukewarm. 
And we're going to get into this in the week to come. He writes seven letters to seven churches. And I believe that that represents seven eras of the church chronologically. That's what I believe. And the last church is the church at Laodicea. Okay? Does anyone know what the church at Laodicea struggled with? What did he tell them? He said, I have this against you. You are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. And because of that, I will spit you out. You say that you're rich, but you are naked, blind, pitiful. What does that sound like? It sounds like the church in America. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like Christianity in 2023. And I just feel it that I feel it that I feel it that Jesus is saying it's time to heat up. It's time to get hot and stay hot. Quit with this in and out lukewarm stuff. Go all in for Christ. We only have this life to give this man a sacrifice of praise in reverence of our creator. We stand in awe of him. We fall in fear of him and honor in the presence of his holiness and his majesty. When heaven comes, sin will be gone. Temptation and fatigue and bad days and all the junk will be over. And we will worship him and know him wholly and fully and completely. But right now, we have an opportunity to take John's lead. To realize what an awesome God we serve. What an awesome God is in this room. To realize that the warrior is standing at the door and it gives us an opportunity to bow before him, to lay it all down, to fall at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm all in because that is coming back. The book of Revelation. The whole, the whole idea here, why did he put the book in, in the Bible? It is a warning. It is a warning. Who is he warning? His church. Who does he write the letters to? His church. It is a warning to his church to wake up, to remember, and to repent. That's what the book of Revelation is about. And if there's anybody in this room right now, Go ahead and stand up. Let's stand up this morning. Time is short, my friends. Time is short. And if it isn't for the blood of Jesus... If it wasn't for the sacrifice on the cross and the resurrection, what we're doing here is pointless, totally pointless. Listen to me. If you're here this morning and you have not confessed Jesus as Lord, you're, you're, you're in for a, a time I cannot even imagine. I, I can't even tell you how bad it's going to be. Everything, it sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not. There's no words for it. Do you want to stand in front of this man and watch him condemn you? Do you want that online? Does that sound like something you want to experience? Not me. And you can think maybe this isn't real. Maybe it's all, you know, maybe it's all hype. It's not. It's actually going to happen sooner than later. And if there's anybody in this room and you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you're not behind him and with him, you need to get right with God right now. Not next week. You don't, you're not promised tomorrow, let alone next week. This isn't about scaring you. This isn't about fear-mongering. No. No, this is reality. A voice crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Christ. It says he's coming. Wake up. He's pulling you. He's drawing you. Right now, there's people in this room, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you, and you're hot, and you're sweaty, and you just want to leave, but there's something inside of you that says, no, stay. That is the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And if there's anybody in this room right now and you do not know Jesus as Lord, I want you to be bold. I want you to shoot your hand up really quick all over the room. I see you. Shoot your hand up. You want me to give you a statistic? Did you know that 
Only 40% of any congregation, maybe it's 20%, Faith, I forgot which, I forgot which, 20, 20, 20% of any given congregation is born again, spirit filled, 20%. Scripture says in the last days, when I come back, many people will call on my name and they will say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. That man. If there's anybody in here and you do not know 100% certain that you're going to be with Jesus when he comes back, he can come back at any time. I want you to shoot your hand up. I'm going to give you another opportunity. Don't pass it up. Don't pass it up. I see that hand. I see you. Is there anybody else? You may never have another opportunity like this. I see that hand. Be bold. Be bold. You can put your hands down. All right, you ready for this next part? It's going to take some bravery. This next part will require you to lay down your dignity and sacrifice your pride. Okay? Christ says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. What are the chances you get to heaven? And Jesus says, do you remember that time at the church when you decided not to go forward? Do, do you remember that time where you had an opportunity per, to profess your faith, but you said no? So right now, if you raised your hand, I just want you to come down front. If you raised your hand, be bold. Come on. There's no shame in it. There's no shame in it whatsoever. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come now. If you didn't raise your hand and you know you're supposed to be down here, come now. Yeah. Elders, would you guys, would everybody come down here, right down here to the front, right? Um, here's what I want to do. I want everybody in the room to say this prayer. And I want to preface this by saying this is not the end. This is the beginning. We don't rest on this. We live in this, but we work from it, okay? And we live the life that we were always designed to live. So I want everybody in the room right now watching online, we're all going to say this together, all right? And then we're going to rejoice right after it. You ready? Jesus, I put my faith in you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you lived for me. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you rose again. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. That I can live this life the way that you always intended. I put my faith in you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me whole. In Jesus' name. Somebody give God a shout of praise in the house. <laughs> Scripture says when one person comes to Christ, all of heaven breaks out in worship. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How important must your soul be how important must your eternity be that the Son of God, God himself, came down and died? How important must your soul be that the enemy is doing everything in his power to get you to walk away from Christ? How important must your soul be? Right now, if there's anybody in this room that needs prayer, whatever that may be, I'm going to ask you to come down here. Right now, if you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer for deliverance, if you need prayer for peace, if you need prayer for restoration, I want you to come. Elders, would you guys give anybody who came down front here, would we, we got a gift we want to give to you. It's just a, it's a gray bag. It's got some next steps in it for you. It's got a Bible. We want to give you, bless you with a gift. If there's anybody else that needs prayer, okay, I want you to come right down here. Just make your way down this aisle to this side. Everybody on this side, just scoot down here. 
And anybody that needs prayed for, I want you to come down here. I'm going to pray and dismiss, but we're going to we're going to stay here and we're going to pray. So if you need that, I want you to come down. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we just thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are holy. We thank you that you are seated on the throne. We thank you that you are coming quickly with a new heavens and a new earth, an eternity beyond our imagination. I thank you, Father, for every person in this room that came forward and didn't come forward, that made a decision for Christ this morning. I pray that you'd speak to them, reveal yourself to them in a new way. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. All of God's people said, amen. We'll see you guys next week.